I'm going to jump right into it because I have, as always, more uh, a bigger outline than I have time to talk about it all. And uh, when it comes to, I guess I should introduce myself a little bit. My name is Scott Marcus. I have been working to some degree in the uh, entertainment and paranormal field since 1999 when I first did this very amateur uh, documentary back when I was 18 about Haunted Chicago. And eventually I had a book come out because uh, there just was too many great stories. I couldn't fit them all into a documentary. That book is Voices from the Chicago Grave, as you can see right here. Also, by the way, if you're more of an ebook person, uh, it's also available on Amazon for Kindle. Uh, so if you want to do that, you can just uh, search for it over on Amazon. Um, but I, I, and then I'll sign your Kindle. If we get to meet in person, I'll sign your actual device. I have been doing these online events, free live streams over at facebook.com slash what's your ghost story and what's your ghost story.com is my website. Uh, but the idea is to just find a, a time of day where we can talk about fun things. We can get our mind off of all of the bizarre stuff that's constantly happening in the news and talk about some more bizarre things that are on the fun side. And, uh, in the process, I've ended up connecting with a lot of people. I've done a couple, several dozen episodes at this point, live on Wednesday nights uh, around sunset. And one episode I did, uh, it kind of stuck with me because I've had some bizarre experiences in my life telling ghost stories to somebody who's really engaged and wants to hear the story. And then a skeptical person comes up and uh, kind of tries to ruin everything. Now, I don't, I'm not anti-skeptic at all, but um, I'm, I am pro-politeness. <laughs> so, uh, so I want to tell uh, a handful of these stories about uh, the actual haunted places and the paranormal experiences I've had, but then also talk about how uh, the lessons I've learned telling them to a skeptical audience. Because I think anybody that is here, anybody that comes to a paranormal conference, you've probably had the experience too, where you are telling a story to a friend and then somebody else comes in like with an axe to grind, which, you know, just because you don't share the same value system or belief system, somebody who doesn't believe in ghosts, doesn't mean that they should be able to look down on you, just like you wouldn't be looking down on them for being skeptical. When I began doing my research back in the early 2000s, late 90s, a statistic I found pretty quickly and repeated was that only about one third of Americans believe in ghosts. And um, I, I, I tested that, and I was surprised how accurate that ended up being. Because once the documentary first came out, I started getting booked to give speeches and presentations at libraries or other community events. And I would ask the audience, how many people here believe in ghosts? Now, this is an event that's specifically about telling ghost stories. And even in that scenario, only about one third of the audience would put their hand up. And I found that to be wonderful. I thought that was awesome. Because that shows that whether you believe in a ghost story or not, or you believe in the possibility of ghosts or not, um, everybody loves to hear a good story. So no matter what your belief system, whether you're talking about from a religious spiritual standpoint or just any other way you could uh, differentiate between people, everybody loves a good ghost story. And uh, it's a really great way to just connect as people. We all love ghost stories, no matter who you're voting for. I was at one party and there was a little bit of a lull in it. And then the, the hostess asked me like, hey, Scott, could you talk about uh, one of the more interesting things that you've been working on lately? And the timing was really good because I had just done an investigation at the Tribune Tower in downtown Chicago on Michigan Avenue. And I've got a, a really good friend named Patty Vasquez, who is, uh, I know her through stand-up comedy, but she had a radio, radio show on WGN Radio for a long time. And it was a late night show as well. So by the time her show ended, it was maybe two or three in the morning, something like that. And we were the only people in the building. And she got permission, special permission, so that after we did the, uh, an episode of her show, then we'd have the run of a downtown historic skyscraper in Chicago. How cool is that? Um, and that's one of the great things that just working in the paranormal field has allowed me to do is to have some fun adventures like this. So um, why would this place be haunted? Um, I think any theater is haunted, as you know. Like most theaters have their own ghost stories. And this is a theater of sorts and the fact that it is entertainment. It is people coming in and giving a performance every night. And if you guys have ever seen the studio, it was on uh, Michigan Avenue right at street level. It had the, the kind of fish, uh, fish tank appearance where everybody standing on the sidewalk could look in. So we looked around in the studio area for a while. Didn't really have anything happen. Uh, by the way, there's a way more in-depth YouTube video that kind of takes a look back at this event and all the investigation with a lot more depth. Uh, I'll, there will be links uh, that you guys should follow. Also, another interesting thing that might make the Tribune Tower haunted, you know, we have the idea that an item, an artifact can be haunted. A uh, haunted doll, a haunted whatever, an antique of some sort. Well, what about pieces of spiritually or uh, tragically important areas? The Tribune building has all of these pieces from around the world literally embedded in it. And, uh, and the inside and outside at the ground floor level, uh, you have uh, some wreckage from the 9-11 attacks. 
you have a piece of the Great Pyramid Giza, you have a part of the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral, and on the inside you have rocks from Bethlehem, uh, where allegedly the taken from the exact site where Christ was born, there's a lot of different energies that are pulled from around the world and put encased in cement right here. So could any of these things be bringing their own energy? And maybe they all are bringing a little bit, and who knows what comes of that? There's a lot of, I like, I like to geek out on the theory side of things, and the Tribune Tower is awesome for that. So we go up throughout the building, and it was really fascinating because um, we found one area, we, we, we talked to the security guards, the overnight shift, which is always the best people to talk to when you're trying to get the real scoop. And uh, they told us about a couple of places where they felt uncomfortable, and one of them was very, very high up in the building, and it was a little stairwell that they felt very uncomfortable. Now we went up there, and EMF was off the charts. And that's not paranormal. There was just unshielded wiring up there like crazy. And we were able to debunk why people would feel uncomfortable there because, uh, you know, wildly uh, free-flowing, unsheltered energy uh, could sometimes have an effect on how we perceive an environment. We could feel like we're being watched. We could feel paranoid. And that just has to do with our own uh, brain electrical makeup. So that was kind of neat to be able to debunk that. But my absolute highlight of this night was when the security guards said, you guys have to check out the 24th floor. This is an area where there was a suicide and they believe this person that killed themselves still makes their presence known and they don't like to patrol it at all. And uh, so we needed them to actually be able to man the elevators because everything was locked down for the night. So they brought us up, we all get out, security guards as well, and uh, we, we start to try to ask them questions and as soon as our back is turned, they flee. They were so uncomfortable being there that they left because they didn't want to be there at all, even with, with a group of people. And to me, that resonates. Like, that's not evidence of anything paranormal, but it's evidence of the effect that area has on these people. So, jump back to the party where I'm telling the story and talking about this fun adventure. And, of course, right next to me is sitting Debbie Downer, who is just rolling her eyes and loudly scoffing at every story I have to say, every fact I'm trying to put out there. Um, very unhelpful as a storyteller to have somebody just undercutting you constantly. And the wild thing was that she would try to throw me off with random questions, like very random questions. The one that really stands out to me was when she asked me, oh, what floor was it on? Where these security guards were supposedly so afraid. What floor was it? And um, as if I happened to say a number, she'd be like, yeah, he's right. You know, I mean, obviously she was just trying to throw something at me. And in the moment, as I was telling the story, I didn't remember what floor it was. And for the record, it was the 24th. Um, I said, oh, I, you know, I, I could make a guess, but, you know, we could look at the YouTube video. It's on there. I don't remember it off the top of my head. And she goes, see? as if that's evidence of anything. All I could really do was just, you know, there's a group of people here that want to hear the story, try to uh, ignore as much as possible, um, but really be focused on the story and be focused on the people that are trying to hear it. Now, she is never somebody that's going to come around, unfortunately, in this case. And, um, but you know, then that's never the point. Like you, you never tell a story or try to convey your emotions or your opinion on something with the idea to convince someone, you're just telling your own thing and whether they latch aboard or not, um, that's, that's their prerogative, it's their loss if they don't. Um, but I would say though that looking back, the one thing I would have done differently is I would have just been plain as day as she interrupted me for the millionth time just saying, hey, why are you being so rude right now? I'm not being mean to you. It's a little passive aggressive, I'll, I'll, I'll concede that. But I think if you were to just call out that terrible action, like a, like a toddler, like you're talking to a toddler, um, without demeaning too much, uh, that it maybe would diffuse the situation. Maybe she would have then stepped back and I would have been able to talk to everybody else with ease. Um, anyway, I just, I always try to, to take some sort of a lesson uh, from each moment. And as somebody that led, led a tour group for a long time in Los Angeles, I, I ran uh, and it started the LA Hauntings Ghost Tour, where we took people from uh, downtown LA through the downtown area, which was a lot of fun, and then down Hollywood Boulevard, and we got to tell uh, you know celebrity ghost stories, but then also just all sorts of bizarre, nefarious parts of uh, Los Angeles' uh, distant, distant past. Being a tour guide leader, as a lot of the other presenters can talk about, it, it gives you such great opportunity to connect with people, to hear some first-hand account stories, but it also forces you into situations where, um, in this scenario, I had a birthday girl that rented out the whole tour for her birthday. She was super duper into ghost stories and that's so great, but literally everybody else on the tour just wanted to get to the bar afterwards. So they were dragged along as I was taking everybody through downtown LA and talking about history and hauntings and these people just wanted to get to the club. And one person, uh, you know, if very frequently I would ask on my tours, uh, is anybody here a straight up skeptic? That they don't believe in the paranormal, they don't believe in ghosts at all. And, uh, and definitely, there'd usually be one or two on the tour, and I would always try do my best to make them feel welcome and say, good, it's always good to have somebody here to keep us balanced, to make sure that when 
when somebody jumps during an investigation, they can say, dudes, it's windy outside or it's cold and the house is creaking. It's not a ghost. You got to have that balance. So I would always kind of go out of my way to try to make the more skeptical people that got dragged on the tour feel like, okay, well, at least this isn't some like bizarre indoctrination uh, <laughs> ceremony where we have to believe in ghost stories to have a good time. So um, on this one particular uh, tour, somebody was just, had all the, all the bad body language, uh, arms crossed, very much uh, scowling, more, more aggressive than you would ever want to have in your audience. And uh, because it was a private tour, I could take people wherever the birthday girl wanted to go. And American Horror Story had just come out. I knew where the house was. And I blew her mind by going into that neighborhood and letting everybody go out and take pictures of the house from American Horror Story, season one. And um, one of the people that did not get off the van, out of the van, when I stopped was this super skeptical person. Um, I guess skeptical about having a good time at all, right? I should stop cutting them down so much as I'm trying to bridge gaps here. Um, but... She asked me, so what do you think are what do you think about orbs? Which seems like the biggest gotcha set a trap for you question, uh, coming from a skeptic, because ghosts can sometimes present themselves on camera, in film, in video, uh, or stills as these little, you know, glowing, floating orbs, these spheres. Uh, however, dust appears that way, sometimes bugs do, even high humidity, smoke, all sorts of things can cause these false positives. So to me, I said, um, in addition to talking about that, I said, a photo with an orb in it to me is meaningless unless there's something that goes along with it. Let's say an EMF detector spiked at that same time. Or I told the story about how my mom and cousin, I brought them down because I'm crazy like this. I brought them down to Bachelor's Grove Cemetery uh, back when I was doing my documentary in 1999. And I just told a group of people to fan out, walk around the grounds, enjoy yourselves. And if you think you feel anything, if you think you're experiencing anything, just let me know. And my mom and my cousin thought they felt a cold spot on this beautiful summer day. And so they decided to come back and tell me about it. And by the luckiest coincidence ever, I had a photographer with me that took a picture of them as they're on their way back to talk to me. And floating behind them is a huge orb. Now, in and of itself, I wouldn't have thought much of it, except that they thought they felt a cold spot right where that orb appears in the photo. Like that to me is a great example of an orb that is paranormal. And, um, and so I... I this is how I presented the idea that orbs in and of themselves, I think you can't call that evidence, but if there's something else that backs it up, now maybe we're talking. And the I had one negative review in the history of my tour, and it was this one person, because I didn't give enough credibility to orbs. What? The skeptic believed in orbs? The, of all the things for the skeptic to actually believe in, they believe in orbs? And, I, and so I think for me, the lesson to take away... For one, I said everything I, I wanted to say, so I was very true to my message. However, knowing I was talking to a skeptic, uh, an aggressive one, I should say, I felt I maybe I was a little too guarded with my language. I didn't speak with enough conviction, um, and she saw that as a weakness. And then the last thing to take away from this for me was, like, you don't really know what, where somebody's coming from. This person may be skeptical but wants to believe to some degree because this person somehow believed in the, the, the last thing that I would have believed in when it comes to the paranormal. And... Um, and yeah, and, and I think the last thing I would have done w would be I would have I should have asked the question back to her. Like you're obviously asking this for a reason, so let me get your uh, point of view. I think my favorite ever first-hand account ghost story uh, happened at the battlefields of Gettysburg. Uh, yes, one of the most haunted places in America for very good reason. Um, yeah, I don't really need to go into what was the Civil War and what was the bloodiest battle of it. Uh, if you're here, you know that the, the battlefields and the whole town of Gettysburg is uh, this amazing, beautifully haunted place. Uh, and a, a really an important place to go as, as Americans in general. It's just, it's, it's an incredible experience. If you haven't yet been, when the world opens up again and we can go on road trips easily, the battlefields of Gettysburg, you must, must dedicate a long weekend to it. And one of the great things that you can do is you get an audio self-guided tour. Uh, you, you go to the gift shop, the visitor center, and you can buy these bundles of CDs and they tell you where to go and they talk about the, the, the battle unfolding as you go from point A to B to C to D. Um, it's, an all-day experience to do this because this battle took place and, and over the course of three days and so much happened. I was recently at a party and somebody asked me again, like they, they were obviously into ghost stories and they, they wanted to hear something I've seen. And to be honest with you, even though I've been doing this since I was 18 years old and I've got a little bit more gray hair than I did back then, uh, actually I actually haven't seen all that much. Uh, I'm out there as a journalist, as a paranormal journalist, just trying to get the story, tell the story accurately, do a lot of research. I'm not too much of an investigator. But on this night, uh, by the way, it was December of 2012. And I always say that because I want to point out that it was not tour season and it was not an anniversary of any of the battles. There were no reenactments going on. 
There was nothing going on. It was December. It was dreary and cold. We were at the site of Pickett's Charge, which is the high water mark, as they call it, the high water mark of the Southern Progression. It's the furthest north the Confederacy ever got, and they hit this little wall, this slave-built stone wall, that the Union was able to retreat from and then pick off the Confederates as they were trying to climb over it, and that's what ended that, uh, that charge across this three quarters of a mile open field where thousands upon thousands of Confederates were charging across. Um, so myself and one other friend were looking around, checking it out, kind of just take a moment to ourselves and then, okay, well, I want to hit it. We got a couple more stops left. And as we're about to turn to go in, we hear boom, 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 the unmistakable sound of three cannon shots firing in the distance. And they were also firing from right where we came from. So we knew we didn't pass anything going on back there. What in the world was that? And of course, I'm standing there with a video camera on pause in my hand, pointlessly. So of course, I hit record after the fact, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and nothing's happening. Like, all right, I don't know. I don't, I don't have no idea what that was, but I guess, all right, let's hit it. And then boom, again, cannon fire. The cannons continue. This time, I am still rolling on my video recorder, and um, the cannons continue and continue, and then it, they're soon joined by the lighter pops of gunfire, and that builds as well. And eventually you can't hear individual sounds anymore. It's just a cacophony of sound off in the distance coming from where we just emerged from. Um, and I've no, we just stood there dumbfounded, listening, absorbing all of this. And eventually the, the sounds faded and stopped. And it's at that point that the friend I was with ran back to the car where everybody else was just hanging out inside, staying warm, said, they're still fighting out here. Now, at that point, we put the CD back on and we listened to what happened, the story of Pickett's Charge, and the battle started where we heard the opening shots just now. And at that point, this was the, the largest munitions bombardment in the history of the world. So much gunpowder was burned in those first moments that it was kind of a shock and awe of its era. And it was amazing because we, standing there in 2012, we were able to listen into 1863. To be able to witness something like that is just amazing. So I was telling this story, again, just recently at a party to somebody that really wants to hear a ghost story. And actually, that somehow magnetizes somebody who doesn't believe in ghosts to stand next to that person and also hear it. And they said, well, do you know that there were speakers buried in the ground in the battlefield? I'm like, well, no, we don't know that. I didn't bring my GPR out to do that kind of a search. Like, you know, they could have burrowed them into, uh, into the trees. Like I didn't, I didn't metal detect the trees. I don't know whether or not there were speakers in there. Uh, and, and this person kept throwing these insanely aggravating, well, what if scenarios at you? And to me, uh, to me, the best thing to do is just acknowledge them. Like, no, I can't prove that. All I can say is what I witnessed. I'm not, never trying to prove a point, but I am just giving you my firsthand account. The leg up I will always have over somebody else that's doing that is that I was there and you weren't. I think the more you acknowledge somebody's super, super far-fetched reaches for an explanation, uh, the more you can acknowledge that I'm being mild-mannered and I am addressing you and your ideas are crazy. You don't even have to say them, but you can just re restate what they are. Like, do I, can I prove there were not speakers buried in the battlefield? No, I can't prove that. But it seems unlikely. And really quickly, I want to acknowledge that one of my very, very best friends is not only a skeptic, but an atheist. So he doesn't believe in anything in the supernatural or spiritual world. And, um, and we've been friends for a very long time. And I, I think because we respect each other so much, we have never actually brought up this topic until recently. I think we've just kind of like steered clear, like you're into your thing, I'm into my thing. And we've got plenty of other similar interests that we can talk about. Um, but I uh, got into it with him not too long ago, just to kind of like understand where he's coming from. And the really fascinating thing was, you know, if you were to take a wide look at it and say, Scott believes in ghosts and believes that places are haunted and that the dead could come back in some way and make their presence known and that there's all of these other phenomena that everything, to me, everything's possible until we can prove otherwise. And he's got the, a little bit of the opposite approach and to him, he, he believes in nothing. So it sounds like, that's so nihilistic to say it that way and I apologize, but um, that sounds like so diametrically opposed that there couldn't possibly be a way to say like, oh, I can see it your way. But the more we talked about it, the more we got to the core of an issue. And on my side, um, I believe that the unexplained exists in this world. And as we know things today, we probably, we can't really find all the answers that we want to. He, to his credit, and to my surprise actually, believes that unexplained things do happen in the world. That there are unexplainable moments that 
people are able to witness. Now, I do have to say that I have also talked to skeptics who believe, and they've actually said this to me, if you've experienced a ghost, uh, a haunting of some sort, you have some element of schizophrenia in you. Like, okay, obviously that person's not going to be able to, uh, to jive <laughs> with having an open mind. If they think you're mentally deranged, if, you're, if you say, oh, I heard somebody say my name or somebody call out to me, um, no, you're schizophrenic, and that's the end of the discussion verifiable, put a stamp on it and send you to the loony bin. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. But um, but my friend, he said that, yes, I think uh, people honestly do witness unexplainable things. And in time, science will will uh, understand what that is and assign it something, uh, whether it's biology or earth science or whatnot. Like, I can totally respect that idea that everything in time is, is explainable by science. And I, I think most things are explainable by science a lot, uh, but I think there is a spiritual element, and that's the thing we won't totally jive on, but that is already means we are so much closer in our disagreement than we ever thought we were. So that that's a really cool thing. The more you can boil down your philosophies and beliefs about anything, the more you find out that you share a lot of the same ideas as somebody that's actually opposed to you than you might expect. Last story I'm going to tell. Um, I was talking to a skeptic in Los Angeles once, a person that wasn't intensely passionate about it, but somebody said, I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in any of that stuff. Their ghost stories are fun, but I, you know, none of that stuff's real. And I said, well, here's one idea. And I explained what a residual haunting was, which if you're here, you know what it is. It's a replay of a historic event for whatever reason, an emotionally charged event happens, scars the area, and people in modern day are able to see the past, which is very similar to what I just experienced at Gettysburg, where I was able to hear the past. And I gave the example of Peg Entwistle, which uh, maybe you know her by name, but you even if you don't, you definitely know that there's a ghost haunting the Hollywood sign of a girl who in 1934 committed suicide by jumping off the letter H. Um, and that is a very wide look at the story because the real story, the full story, I should say, is that yes, indeed, 1934, a very accomplished and established actress. Everybody always says she's a struggling actress and they kind of undercut who she is as a person here. She was a very... Uh, established theater actors on the East Coast. And she, along with many other people, decided to move out to California and try to see if they could make it on the big screen. Well, so many actors were leaving the, the stage for that reason that at that point, it was kind of like you blacklist yourself. If you say you're leaving your theater company to try to make it in the movies, you can't go back. You've burnt your bridge. So you got to sink or swim. That's all there is to it. Also, what was going on in Peg's life was that she was going through a terrible divorce that got worse by the day. Um, it just it was a really, really dark time in her life. Um, and it's true, she did get cast in a movie called 13 Women by RKO Studios. And unfortunately, uh, most of her part was cut. She is still in the film, but it was very, very cut down compared to what she was doing. Uh, I'm sure that hurt the ego a lot, but I think she had a lot more going on in her life that ultimately made her decide to commit suicide. And the other reason I say that is because People just talk about it like, oh, she got cut out of a movie, so she killed herself, kind of making it seem so flippant that it was an impulse thing. She left her uncle's house on Beachwood Canyon Drive and then walked about a mile and a half up the side of a mountain to reach the Hollywood sign. She had a million opportunities to think about this and talk herself out of it. She knew what her mission was, which was to end her life. And then the other part of the story that people kind of miss out is, uh, again, just the sad struggle of her, is that she jumped off to the top of the letter H and she did not die immediately. It was an instant death. She uh, had her pelvis crushed, just pulverized. She was immobilized about 150 feet into a ravine below the letter H. And she slowly died over the course of probably a day and a half. It was a sad, terrible, grisly death. And then cut to today. People driving along Beachwood Canyon Drive would see her walking along the side of the road up towards the Hollywood sign. People hiking in Griffith Park would encounter her but not be able to say hi to her because it's a residual haunting. She's not consciously there, but her actions are repeating. Uh, they'll even say that they smell her gardenia perfume. Meanwhile, along the ridgeline of that same mountain range at the uh, Griffith Park Observatory, uh, people would be able to see the Hollywood sign and then see a figure jump off the letter H. Police are called. Uh, rescue and, re uh, and recovery uh, crews will come out and no body is ever found. So it is a residual haunting through and through. People that have no idea who she is or what her story is will witness her final moments. And it's not like it's a conscious haunting. It's not like she is killing herself over and over again. It's just a replay of a very emotionally charged event. So I, I told the story to, again, this skeptical friend of mine. And, and she's like, oh, residual haunting. Yeah, okay, I can see that. That makes sense to me. So she went from not believing in ghosts at all to this whole huge part of hauntings, residual hauntings, the more, most common type of haunting, um, being a totally reasonable, plausible thing. So I think the great lesson to learn there is 
even though somebody might define themselves in one way, they could be very open to taking in new information. And they might not be as committed to an idea as they thought. They might be more open to change. Not, I don't believe in ghosts, but I do believe in residual hauntings. That is my presentation. Thank you all so much. Uh, my website is whatsyourghoststory.com. The, there's a newsletter sign up on that page. And really that's the best way to get in touch, stay in touch. Wednesday nights on Facebook Live, facebook.com slash whatsyourghoststory. I pick a new topic each time. And it's all about sharing information, sharing fun stories, interesting stories. Uh, playing some mental gymnastics, trying to understand different uh, different paranormal theories. And it's really, more than anything, it's about connecting with each other as friends, even though maybe we're not getting, in, uh, getting together in person anymore. And again, finding out that there's a lot more that we have in common than we have different.